Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. We are at the beginning of our second year of teaching in Matthew. And last week, I missed the first weekly teaching in that time. Yeah, it was just crazy with um, Rosh Hashanah. And by the way, the rapture didn't happen on Rosh Hashanah this year. Okay, we got more time to go out and share Messiah with a with our lost and dying world. Uh, we've got another year, and I know people are going to start looking at other dates, and we'll talk about those as we go. Um, but, um, you know, be thinking, what is it that you can do during this time to be that conduit through which the Holy Spirit can work to reconcile somebody else with God, with Messiah? And we're just the conduit. The Holy Spirit does the work. What is it we can do? How do we put ourselves in that position? That's the mind frame right now. All right. So we're going to get, we're going to go back into Matthew 24, an awesome chapter. Very misunderstood chapter, too. So it's a Bible study. Let's open up our Bibles. And we're starting off in Matthew 24, verse 5, or verse 15. That's where we left off. But I want to start off in verse 15 by going down and looking at verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of the world unto this time nor ever shall be. So now when we go here, this ab therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, does this happen right at the midpoint where Great Tribulation starts, or does this happen before? Since this says, then, this actually happens before the midpoint, and we're going to see that. And that's important because we're going to put some timelines together here. So therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the pro Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. What's the holy place? Think about it. Is it the temple? Is it the temple mount? Actually, the temple is kind of divided into two areas. You have the holy place, which is what this is referring to, which has like the menorah, the showbread, the table with the showbread, the altar of incense. And then you have the Holy of Holies, which would have what? The Ark of the Covenant. Um, and the Ark of the Covenant was not in the last temple that was destroyed by Rome. Um, it probably won't be in the temple in um, the in, in during tribulation. I bet it's in the temple in, that Messiah will sit in. But you know what? It could be in the temple that will come up during um, tribulation. And we'll see, because there's a chance that they actually have it at this point, that it's hidden away. Um, could they start doing sacrifices right now? Think about it. Could they? All speculation. This is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that all you need is the foundation and an altar, and the altar has been done. I've heard that they have contemplated doing it in some of the chambers underneath the temple. Um, what would happen worldwide if they started doing sacrifice? Oh, my goodness. My understanding is that the attack last year um, was largely inspired by the fact that they were talking about sacrificing red heifers. And they were trying to take Israel away from that. I don't know that to be true. A lot of this is what I'm th what I'm hearing, um, and some of it, you know, if, to, to me, if I hear it, it's got to be from a re what I consider to be a reliable source. Let me ask you this: What day? When do they have to have the temple? They have to have a functional temple by the time the abomination of desolation is in place. Because as we're going to see to Daniel, let's go to Daniel 9. What we're going to see in Daniel is that at this point, the, let's read it first. And he shall firm a, confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's a week of years, seven years, and that's tribulation. It's going to be a perfect week on God's calendar. That means tribulation starts at the very beginning of a year, or close to it, on God's calendar. 
It doesn't start any time of the year. A week of years has to start at the beginning of a week of years. And tribulation is, or excuse me, the rapture is right before it. So if you try to put the rapture in December, February, May, you've got issues here. Seriously, think about it. But anyhow, so he, he shall confirm a covenant for many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of a, a wing of the abomination shall be one who makes desolate. That sounds crazy, but from what I understand is that it says on a wing of the temple, the abomination of desolation is going to happen. That's basically all that says. Is this like right in the middle of tribulation? It says in the middle, but that word middle is midst, in the midst of. It doesn't have to be perfect. Elsewhere in scripture, we see um Times, times, half a times. We see uh, 1,260 days. We see 42 months. And we're going to look at some of those in a little bit later with another verse. But this isn't giving us an exact time. Is there a place that we can go to get an exact time for this? And it's important. There is. Go to Matthew or go to Daniel 12. We are going to see something in a little bit. So I'm going to ask you to take my word for it right now. Daniel 12 pretty much starts, is, is all about the, mid, the the great tribulation, the second half of tribulation. And we're going to look at that based on something Messiah says in a little bit. And from the time that the daily sacrifices is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, that's the same event, there shall be 1,290 days. How many days are in, in three and a half years? 1,260. Now, this is an extra 30 days. The abomination of desolation happens 30 days prior to the midpoint. Seriously. And we're going to show you what, why, and how that's important in a little bit. But while we're here, why don't we, because these two, and I've seen people try to add these numbers together, it doesn't work. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,000, um, excuse me, 1,335 days. How many days is that more than 1,260? 75 days. It would take you to Hanukkah. Let me show you something real quick. What does Hanukkah mean? See this word dedication here? Let's see what the, what the word for dedication is in Hebrew. It's Hanukkah. I know it's not spelled the way we spell it. We spell it as a transliteration. You put whatever letters you can in line to make it sound like what this is supposed to sound like. So the word for dedication in Hebrew is Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the feast of dedication. We actually see it in the New Testament here. And now it was the Feast of de Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. I remember a couple years ago, there was somebody that was saying that the Feast of Dedication here is uh, Rosh Hashanah. Based on Babylonian calendars, the Jews had it wrong. No, this is Hanukkah. This, okay. Um, and I've got people now who are saying the rapture on Hanukkah. Hanukkah is about the dedication of the temple. Um, and this is, so if we go back here, back to where we were in Daniel, that 75 days from the end of tribulation will be the dedication of Messiah's temple. And you will be blessed if you are there. I'm looking forward to that day. That's going to be cool, a cool day. All right, so we came here. So you have the midpoint of tribulation, Hanukkah, excuse me, and 30 days before that is when the abomination of desolation is spotted. We know that tribulation ends on Yom Kippur. Um, we'll see that next in the next teaching for sure. Um, that's when the great trumpet is blown. I'll point that out when we get back to Matthew. Let's actually do that now. Go back to Matthew.
See in Matthew 24, you go down a little bit, and it's going to tell you. Here we go. And this is next week's teaching. Immediately after tribulation of those days, uh, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give up its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. That's Messiah coming back. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. That's um, Zechariah 12. Those are Jews, earth, tribes, Jews. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a, with a great sound of a trumpet. That's the shofar Haggadola, which is blown on Yom Kippur. Tribulation ends on Yom Kippur. Um, three and a half years before that, it's going to take you to Passover. That's the midpoint of tribulation. That's when the two witnesses will get killed. They're going to arise three and a half days later, probably on the Feast of First Fruits. 30 days before that, when the abomination of desolation is spotted, what day is that? That is Purim. Purim is a day of great celebration, celebrating Israel being um, Israel being saved from utter annihilation. Wow, what a more fitting day to see that abomination of desolation. There are people out there saying, oh, that's rapture. No, it's not. It's not even one of the appointed times in, in Leviticus 23. It's not connected with any of the the great feast days, the, the Shalosh Regalim, the three feet when everybody has to go to Jerusalem. It's not associated with any of those, nor is Hanukkah. All right, so when they see the abomination of desolation, what does this say here? Let's go back. What happens? Then when those, let those who are in Judea flee for the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop go down and not take anything out of his house. And let him in the field not go back to get his clothes. Okay, in other words, it's time to go and you better hurry. What does it mean? Don't go down from the housetop. Well, don't you have to go down the housetop to get out the front door? What are you supposed to do? Just jump off the house? No. In that day, people spent a lot of time up on the top of their houses, especially at night. Because the houses were stone, they'd get really hot during the day. In the evening, things would cool off. A lot of times they'd put their bed rolls up there and they'd sleep up there. But you could literally run from housetop to housetop to housetop to housetop and get out of the city without ever putting your feet on the ground. So where are they going to go? They're heading to, what does it say here? To the mountains. From Judea, they're going to flee to the mountains. There's a lot of different mountains out there, isn't there? The scripture give us more, but more. It gives us a lot more. It tells us exactly where they're going to go to. And they're going to be headed to Petra. How do we know this? Well, it's because scripture tells us. So let's go to um give me a second here. I'm not understanding my notes. Okay, I think I see it. I just wrote something wrong. Go to Matthew Revelation 12. And I believe it's 14, if I just wrote something wrong, like I think I did. Yep, so the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, which she will be nourished for times, times, and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. So, Saint, if you understand Revelation 12, we just finished that one not long ago in our Revelation Bible study. Satan's about to be thrown down to, to the earth. He's trying to kill off the woman, Israel. Why does he want Israel gone? Come on, you know it. And back at the tail end of Matthew 23, Messiah told Jews that you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I always thought that was what they said when they repented and they came to him. No, no, no. That's what they say before he comes back in the second half of tribulation, before he comes back at the end of tribulation. And that's why Satan is trying to kill him all, all off. If they can't say it, he can't come back. What do you mean? He's God. He can do whatever he wants. No, he can't. He can't lie. Anyhow, so now we know it's the wilderness, but it's and it's also mountains. That still gives us some places to go. But she's given two wings of a great eagle. What does that mean? Does that mean she's going to fly? 
See, she's going to be there for three and a half years. He needs time to get there. That's why the, the abomination of desolation has to happen beforehand because they're going to actually be there. And guess what? They're walking. At this point, Satan's going to have control. The Antichrist is going to have control of all kinds of stuff. Probably AI is being involved, be able to shut down cars and everything really easy. But let's see what else we have. If there's something else in Scripture, let's start with the wings of a great eagle. For that, we got to go back to Exodus. Exodus 19, verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings that brought you to myself. So when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, did he give some big eagles there that flew them out? No, they walked. But they had his protection. That's what the wings of the great eagle means. They will be protected going to Petra. Why do I keep saying Petra? Well, let's look at what Scripture tells us about where they're going to go. Let's start by Daniel. We were also talking about this recently in our, our Revelation Bible study. There are people, that, the nations, that will come against the Antichrist during tribulation. They're not going to do too well, but there are also places that he can't touch. And one of those places is in Daniel 11, verses 40 and 41. At that time of the end, this is the last days, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he will enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through them. Satan's going to win. King of the north is probably Assyria. King of the south is Egypt. And they're going to be attacking the Antichrist? It probably explains why in the tail end of Isaiah 19, it describes Israel, Assyria, and Egypt as like together. And I said, all right, fine, I've got to go there. I can't tell you this and not tell you what something says and not go there. Isaiah 19, at the very end, in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria. And the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. In that day, there will be three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Wow. That's pretty wild. And those are Psalm 83 countries. They're going, to get, they're going to get wiped out. I guess not totally, but the people, somehow those countries are going to come back. If you read, and we're not definitely not going there, Matthew 25, it talks about how God will judge the nations, but it's going to be based on how um, they treat Israel. And it's how they treat Israel in the second half of tribulation because, and I'm way off on a rabbit trail here, go to um, oh, what is it? Oh, the War of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38. And this happens like um, three years into tribulation. And the purpose of this is that I, that God says, I will magnify myself, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, these nations are going to be able to say, Oh my goodness, Allah is not greater than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm changing gods. And the nations will get judged by how they treat Israel. Um, I am way off here. So, we know that we got to go back. I never even hit the verse I needed to hit. In Isaiah 40 and 41, he shall also go into the glorious land. Is that South Africa, United States, Germany? No, it's Israel. This is the Antichrist. And many countries shall be overthrown. But, but 
These shall escape from his hands, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Where is where are those peoples? Israel, Psalm 83, nations, peoples. Where is that? That's Jordan, where Petra is located. Let's go now to Isaiah 16. And this is where it really nails it down. Uh, send the lamb to the ruler of the land, from Selah to the wilderness. Selah to the wilderness. What's Selah? Rock. A place in Edom, perhaps an early name for Petra. This is where they'll be heading, Petra. Think um, the original Indiana Jones, and they're you know going through that valley with all the huge, like you know cliffs, and there's like caves and everything in there. Um, Petra is an area, the tourist area. There's already like two hundred fifty thousand rooms, or can house two hundred fifty thousand people. They've got huge areas like amphitheaters and everything, and they have a water source there. It's set and ready to go. For these people to go to. So this is where they're going to be headed to. Let's go back to Matthew 24. Where are we at here? Okay, so in other words, they've got to get going, hurry. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. That's going to make it hard to travel, isn't it? Yeah. And play that your flight not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Wait a minute, doesn't Messiah know that in just a couple of days from when he's saying this, the Sabbath's going to get abolished? He's talking 2,000 years in advance, and he's talking about the Sabbath. Let's just, I'm not going to dwell on this a lot. Let's just go to Ezekiel 44. You know, understand that we will be kings and priests, as it says in Revelation 1. And in Ezekiel 44, 23 and 24, it's telling you a little bit about what those priests will be doing. And they shall teach my, my people the difference between the holy and the unholy. That's the food that people are eating. And cause them to, I'm sorry, between the holy and the unholy, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. That's the food. And controversy, not that there's going to be a big controversy. It's just that two people have a disagreement. They take it to the, to the judges, to the priest, um, and they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes and all of my appointed meetings. That's Torah. And that's the appointed times of the Lord, the feast days. And they shall hallow my Sabbaths. So the Sabbaths are going to be, the Sabbaths, all the appointed times, they're all going to be observed and Torah is going to be observed in the millennial kingdom. Yeah, we if we don't believe this is the millennial kingdom, let's go back to the chapter before this. Um. And the glory of God came into the temple by the way of the gate, which faces toward the east. Yeah, it is. That's the millennial kingdom when Messiah is sitting on the throne again. Um, back to Matthew. Pray, pray that your flight will not be in winter. Well, is it going to be in winter? We don't know. Well, it's going to be on Purim, 30 days before Passover. And that's really going to depend on whether or not the barley is aviv, because the, the first month in a the head of month, not the head of the year, but the head of months is set in Nisan, which used to be a bib. Let's go to what's the best one? Deuteronomy sixteen verse one. Observe the month of the Beeb and keep Passover to the Lord. Okay, that's that month, right? If you look up the word Abib, 
Abib is fresh young barley ears, barley, the month of ear forming, the greening of the crop. In other words, the barley is almost ready. That's when you can start the month. So when the feast of first fruits comes along, guess what you have? You have the first fruits of the barley, which is a picture of Messiah, because Messiah is the first fruits to the resurrection of life. That's how you start the month. That's how all the other years are counted. Um, until you get to the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah, which is um, Tishri 1. We'll get there. A lot of people, Rosh Hashanah got moved. Rosh Hashanah is pagan. It's not in the Bible. It is in the Bible. It's in Ezekiel 40, chapter 1. And I'll be talking about that soon in another video. But it places Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. And a lot of people are teaching it wrong. But that's another teaching that will come out sometime soon. So we're back to Matthew. So, you know, we don't know if it's going to be in the winter or not, but if it's in the winter and there's snow and it's really cold, it's just going to make that traveling that much harder. Um, a Sabbath day journey, we mentioned that. Uh, what it is, and it goes back to a commandment, and I forget where it is, about like don't go out of your abode or out of your house on the Sabbath. It's not one of the things that God said, do this forever. I want to say it goes back into the time that they were in the wilderness and they weren't supposed to go out and get the, um, where does it say? Well, we're not there yet. Yeah, we're on the Sabbath. When they were you know, going out and on the Sabbath, they weren't supposed to go out and get the manna. Now, in a lot of the laws that there are, the, the 613 commandments, judgments, and statutes, some of them in it, in the wording, and you can't see it in English, and it's even hard to see it in Hebrew, is temporary or permanent based on what it says. And this is not one that was permanent. But the custom of the day, the custom, how they interpreted this was that they could do no more than a Sabbath day's journey. And they fudged on this a lot of different ways throughout time. But it's basically time to get to the synagogue and back. It's a custom. Is it like something that is required? No. But more than likely, the people of that day, the day that's going to come up, will still be following that custom of how far they can walk on a Sabbath day. For then there will be great tribulation, such as there has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall be. Wow. Think about what is this going to mean when the Jews finally start looking at the book of uh, some of the New Testament stuff. They'll look at Revelation. They'll read this. They're going to have to do this to see how to get to Petra. Yes, between Daniel 11 and Isaiah 16, they're going to know they need to go to Petra. But I bet some of them are going to be real curious, thinking, oh, maybe we did miss this Jesus thing. They're going to read this, and they're going to think back to how bad um, how bad it was with Germany. How many Jews died during World War II, during the Holocaust? One-third of them died. And that's nothing compared to what's about to happen. Because we know, based in Zechariah, two-thirds are going to die. Twice as many, percentage-wise, are going to die. Well, do we see that phrase anywhere else in Scripture? We do. Go back to Daniel 12, and this is why it said that Daniel 12 is pretty much based in the second half of Tribulation. Because it starts off with, that's not Daniel 12. Let me try this again. Daniel 12, the wording starts off with, at that time, Michael shall stand up. When does Michael stand up? Revelation 12, midpoint of tribulation, when he uh, is the, uh, fighting with Satan, and Satan gets cast out of heaven. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, Israel. For there shall be a time of trouble, that's a time of Jacob's trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even at that time. Does that sound familiar? And at that time, your people, the Jews, will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. This verse, I'm just going to go here just to we're here. This one used to always trouble me. 
And many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt, and it, uh, shame and contempt. And that used to bother me. Where in Scripture? And for you know, quite some time, I could never find a place where people awake to everlasting life and people awake to shame and everlasting contempt. These events are like a thousand years apart. This is the rapture. This is the great white throne judgment. So this is a thousand years in that one scripture right there. Let's go back to Matthew. Twenty-four. And we got to keep on moving. Got a lot to get through still. And it's okay. Um, here we go. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. How long is tribulation? Give me a second. I don't want to go there yet. How long is Great Tribulation? Hmm. We're going to look at that. Three and a half years. 1,260 days. 42 months. Which is it? It matters. All right. Um There would be great tribulation. Okay, let's look at this. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. This is during great tribulation, right? So if they're going to shorten some days, it's going to be shortened during great tribulation. But we have problems trying to shorten days. First of all, we looked at Daniel 9.27. That is a perfect week of years. Is that wrong? Did Daniel get it wrong? Did God come back and write this and it like circumvents and changes what was written to Daniel? No, scripture doesn't work like that. Let's go a couple places and look at a couple other things that, that we see in scripture. Go, to, go with me to Revelation 12. We were just here. 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. That, she, that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. Okay. Let's go down to 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she may fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for times, times, and half a times from the presence of the serpent. So that's 1,260 days, three and a half years. Let's go one other place. Let's go to the next chapter. 13.5. And he was given a mouth. This is talking about the Antichrist, the beast, out of the sea, was given a mouth to speak great, uh, great things and blasphemies and was given authority for to continue for how long? 42 months. And this is after Satan has come down. And we just, I just, um, as I'm recording this, the day before I'm releasing it, I just did a teaching on Revelation 13. And Revelation 13 is an introduction to the second half of tribulation. So the second half of tribulation is described as 1,260 days. It is described as times, times, and half a times, three and a half years, and as 42 months. How do you shorten that? And the other thing is I see people trying to count, and they'll count on this pagan Gregorian calendar that we use that Rome created to try to get us off of God's calendar, and they'll start trying to count days, and to go from this date to that date, and then, then um, put it back onto God's calendar somewhere else. But see, if it's not a perfect three and a half years and a perfect 42 months, it doesn't work. You know, with the, there'll be a time during tribulation where the the days will go back to 30-day months and 360-day years. And you can look at where the barley is or where the sun, how this, excuse me, the moon is spotted for the new month. 
I got a sneeze coming on. Oh. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, but I'm sure God will work out those days. That's why I don't get so uptight like trying to count everything. It just bothers me when people try to count stuff. And I, what really bothers me is when they try to add the 1,290 and 1,335 from Daniel 12. Those numbers just don't go together. Anyhow, I'm getting off a little bit. So what does it mean to shorten the days? Hmm. Go to Amos. Amos told us. That's why, you know, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It's told, and even what Messiah is talking about, this prophecy, it's apocalyptic literature. You have to go back into the Old Testament, into other places, in order to decipher what's being said, not necessarily by what you're seeing in the world. Amos 8, 9 tells us, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord God, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Oh, I get it. It's not the numbers of days that are shortened. It's the daylight that shortened. I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. How do we know this is actually tribulation? Well, it says right here, and it will come to pass, and it shall come to pass in that day. In that day is the last thousand years, and that last thousand years starts at with the rapture and tribulation. Somebody's out there like, no, 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 it starts with the millennial kingdom. Go back, read Joel 2. Joel 2, the, the first verse, is the day of the Lord is here. And then keep reading. What are you reading about? Tribulation. Anyhow, that day, same thing you'll see come up like four times in Ezekiel 38. And that's not, in that day is in Ezekiel 38. And that battle's not happening there. But we can also read this next verse. I will turn your feast into mourning. What does that mean? Where do they go on the feast days? They go up to Jerusalem. During the Great Tribulation, what's in Jerusalem? The Antichrist, who has been indwelled by, the, uh, by Satan himself, and he's taken up his place in the temple. And they ain't going there during their feast. So yes, their feasts have been turned into mourning. And their songs, songs would be joy, are being turned into lamentations. All right. So we know this is definitely the midpoint of tribulation, the great tribulation, where this is talking about. Um, let's go back to Matthew 24. And what do we have? Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, we're, we're there, do not believe it. Why not? Why wouldn't you believe it? For false Christ and false prophets will rise up and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. If possible. It may not be possible to see the elect. What are the elect? The elect are the saints, the people who have been set aside because they have elected to follow Messiah. Hmm. All right. So what is this talking about? What is, what, what is this false Christ and prophet? False Christ, that's an antichrist. And false prophets. The false prophet, what are they going to do? We've talked about this recently in Matthew 13, or in Revelation 13, so let's go there. Revelation 13. Interesting that these are coming up at the same time. Revelation 13, um, 11 through 14. And again, Revelation 13 is an introduction to what Satan and his minions are going to try to do during, during this great tribulation. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth who had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Looks like a prop, looks like a lamb, but is really of Satan. This is your antichrist. Excuse me. Your false prophet um, comes up out of the earth. Earth is usually considered to be Israel. Is a could be is this? Give me a second. Um, it could be that he's a Jew, but that he was scattered somewhere else. Because this sort of means that he's a Jew, 
but he could be scattered somewhere else because the dispersion in 722 BC, at least that's a year I was told it happened. I wasn't there. Yeah, I'm old, but I'm not that old. When Assyria was scattered all over the world, we don't really know who those Jews are. For all I know, the Pope right now could be a Jew, and he doesn't even know it. Or maybe he does. Anyhow, who, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the, the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who, whose deadly wound was healed. We talked about that in the Revelation Bible study in Revelation 13 that just came out. Um, he performs great signs and even makes fire come down from heaven on, on the earth in the sight of men. Oh, my goodness. Elijah did that. Imagine, I'm sure that if he does that, he's going to say, remember, Elijah did that. Who am I working for? Come on, follow me, because this is from God. I am of God. See, Elijah did it. I did it. I'm falling down fire in heaven. And there's all kinds of other great signs. Right. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. God's allowing him to do these. He was granted to do it. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and live. Question for you. This image of the beast, making an making a image of it. What is that? That's an idol. Is that a godly thing? No. So here's this person doing amazing wonders that are coming true and telling you to do something God said not to do. Is that in Scripture anywhere? It is. It is. Go to Deuteronomy 13. <laughs> if there arises among you a prophet or a dream or a dream, then he gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known. He just told you to meet an idol. He didn't say to go after other gods. Well, Romans 6 tells you, you are who you follow. If God tells you A and somebody else tells you B and you do B, you're following B. So if God, the scripture says something and the Pope says something else, who are you going to follow? Okay, anyhow. Who are you going to follow? Ghostbusters. Never mind. Weird the things that go into, into my head. Now, let me keep going here. Um, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, which saying, go out and build an idol of this guy. That's what that would be. Uh, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams. The Lord, your God, is testing you. That's why the Lord allows him to do it. To know whether you love the Lord or your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord, your God, and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. Is there anything else in Scripture that tells us about this? Yeah, there is. Second Thessalonians two. Go to Second Thessalonians two, and we're going to go. Um, hmm. Okay, I've got time to finish this all up. Yep, I'll be good. 2 Thessalonians 2, and we're going to start at verse 9 to 12. The coming of the lawless one, lawless, without Torah. That's what it means, without the law, without Torah. Um, and who is the lawless one? The Antichrist. Um, is according to the works workings of Satan. So lawless one is definitely not good. And the Antichrist is a man of lawlessness. Lawlessness is the same thing as unrighteousness. It's the condition of being without Torah, without by choice or ignorance. But, he, the, but this power comes with all power, signs, and lying wonders. This is what we've been talking about. With, and with uh, all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So, and lots and lots of people, multitudes are going to get saved during tribulation. Everybody's not following around, worshiping this beast and taking the mark and, and doing all this stuff. A lot of people are getting killed off when they're and being de deheaded, having their heads cut off, but are going to come to eternal salvation. 
because of it. But, hmm. But so, so, so not everybody will be deceived. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they shall believe the lie. And that calling down fire from heaven is that strong delusion. Um, that they may be they, that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's lawlessness. They did not believe the truth. I've talked about this several times. Um, I'm just going to do this shortly. We know John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Messiah is the truth. I want to say it's 1 John 5. I could be wrong, but it tells us there that the Spirit is truth. Let's go real quick to um, the book of Psalms. Can we trust David? Messiah did. It's unbelievable. When we did the earlier part of this, how many of the words that Messiah gave us came right out of the, out of the book of Psalms? We should be able to trust this. So we'll go to Psalm 119, and we're going to look at verse 160. Oh, it's been forever going down here. It's so big. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. So all of Scripture is truth. Does this include the Old Testament? It should. It's in David. It's Excuse me, it's in the Psalms written by David. Did Messiah tell us anything about every word of Scripture? He did. Go to Matthew 4. I want to say it's verse 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What does that mean? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What specifically does that mean? Well, let's answer that question from Scripture. See this little thing here where it says footnote? It tells us right there. It's Deuteronomy 8.3. So let's go to Deuteronomy 8. See, Messiah is the prophet raised up like Moses. He only spoke the words the Father gave him. That's in John 14, um, down a little ways, like in the 20s, maybe 30s in that chapter. Um, this is not Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 8. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe. Well, this is Torah. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the, which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. To test you. Wait a minute. That's the same thing that's being happened in tribulation. They're testing people. Um, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know. Did you know? I believe manna means what is it? I don't know. That's what I've been told. Um, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall live not, excuse me, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So when Messiah quotes part of this verse in Matthew 24, in Matthew 4, he is encompassing all of it and expects you to understand where that's coming from. This testing God's going to test us, Revelation 3.10. The, the letters to the churches are to all the churches of all times. Each, different churches, different times have different attributes of these what's in these letters. But it says, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial. That's tribulation. The day is a thousand years. The hour is a shorter period. It is the seven years of tribulation, but the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This is not like time to go after and get those Jews for what they did. And that's how some people view tribulation. But it's to test those who live on the, dwell on the whole earth. Um, so let's go back. Yeah, we're doing good. We're doing real good here. Let's go back to Matthew 24. Uh, here we go. Easier this way. Yeah. 
See, I told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say, yeah, I'm having notes till 27. Um, so in other words, for false Christ and false prophets will rise up and show you great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Not everybody's going to be fooled by that. People are going to know. See, I have told you beforehand. And how do you know people are going to know? In Revelation 7, it tells you out of tribulation, out of the great tribulation, multitudes are going to come. Those are the tribulation saints that we see coming back to life in the beginning of Revelation 20. See, I told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say, look, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Why? For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the of Son of Man be. This is not the rapture. This is during tribulation, or at the end of tribulation. This is when Messiah comes back. Down here. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. That all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. That's, I believe, Zechariah 10 or 14 or 12. I think it's 12. Anyhow, that is the end of tribulation. That's Messiah coming back. That's what we're looking at here. Um, so let's look at that real quick. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of man. We're just going to go to a couple verses. And I'm just pulling some stuff off my head here. Let's go to Zechariah 14. Where do I want to go? Yeah, let's do that. Zechariah 14, verse 5. We're just going to do a little part of that. When Messiah comes back, thus the Lord will come and all the saints with you. That's Messiah and the saints coming back together. Go to Joel 2. Yeah, I know I'm going fast. Just pause it if you have to and write down the notes. Go to the scriptures and look at it. Joel 2. Um, again, here is the rapture right there. That's where the day of the Lord starts. The day of the Lord is hand that is, is coming for it is at hand. That means it's there. You read down this, and in uh, I went too far. And here is a call to repentance where Israel turns to the Lord, they repent. But blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a flask, fast, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go into the chamber and the bride her dressing room. That's the wedding chambers that Messiah was preparing for us in John 14. Where we're going to be hidden away during tribulation. This is us coming out of them to come back. Um, what day is it? Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly. This is Yom Kippur because it's the only place in Scripture that requires a fast. Okay, there are other fasts that are man-made, but this is the only biblically commanded fast day. Um, let's look at when Messiah comes back. Let's go to Psalm 2. I'm all over the place today. That's okay. Big rabbit trail. Psalm 2. Why do, the, why do the nations rage? Why do they plot such a vain thing? Think about what's going on and when Messiah comes back. All the nations of the world are gathered against him. They, they gather in the, what is it called? Um, Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo. This plain, it's a plain. Um, I think it was Napoleon said it's like the best place in the world ever for a war. And it has a valley that goes down to Jerusalem. And this is where they're amassing. And they want to stop Messiah from becoming the king. They want to stop him from coming back. They know he is. And they and, and the Antichrist that's in Satan are trying to stop him from ruling because they want to rule. That's basically what's going on. Why do the nations rage and they plot a vain thing? What is vain? Useless, worthless. It's going to come to naught. It's not going to happen. It's not going to have any desired effect that they want. The kings of the earth set themselves together and the rulers take counsel together. It's a conspiracy. Against the Lord and his almighty and his anointed saying, 
the Lord, Tetragrammaton, all caps, that's God, uh, the Father, and against his anointed, that's Messiah, the Christ, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. We don't want them to rule against us. Let's kick their butt when they come back and we can have it all. That's what they're thinking. Silly, silly. <laughs> he who sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. The word derision means like, have you ever seen somebody doing something so stupid, so ridiculous? You know they're going to get hurt, but you can't help but laugh. Of course, we have like on YouTube all kinds of like little clips that have like time after time of people doing these things. And we sit there and laugh at these dumb things they're doing where they're getting hurt. That's kind of what this is. But it's kind of like a, a sad looking and laughing like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. And you're like laughing, but you're not. You know what I mean? That's what that means. That's what the Lord's doing. Here's here's what he does when he comes back. Over. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. Armageddon. We're not fighting. We're witnesses. He speaks. It's over. He comes with a sword out of his mouth. What is that sword? It's the word of God. He speaks. It's over. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. Zion is prophetic Jerusalem. Armageddon, it's over. Messiah is going to be set as king. Let's go back to Matthew 24 and wrap up today's Bible study. Matthew 24. Wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. What is that name? First of all, is it eagles? Let's look at that word. An eagle. Since eagles do not usually go in quest of carrion, dead thing, this may be a vulture that resembles an eagle. Yet eagles do not eat dead things. This right here that we're looking at, they're vultures. They're carnivorous birds. Um, so whatever the carcass is, there will be eagles gathered together. This is the Feast of Leviathan. Um, Leviathan, Levi means to join to, and they're supposed to, like the priests or the Levites, and they're supposed to join people to God. And this Leviathan is like joining people to Satan. It's not good. Um, but this is the Feast of the Leviathan. So let's go to um, Revelation 19. And and you saw like at Armageddon, when, when God come back, he speaks, it's over. There's dead people everywhere. These birds are going to come and help eat and help clean it up. And the beasts of the field, they're going to come and have a feast. And it's going to help to clean these things up. Be aware that there was a time that people would look at these prophecies. There's one in Ezekiel, but we're just going to stick with Revelation 19. Time's sake. Revelation 19, starting in verse 17. But they would read these and they're like, there's just no way, because there were no carnivorous birds, no meat-eating birds in Israel. Guess what? Over the past 30, 40 years or so, they've been flocking in like crazy, and now there's tons of them there. Coincidence? No, God's just getting, getting, the, um, getting everything ready to serve this feast for them. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. An angel standing in the sun. Really? How can that happen? Well, it's probably a seraphim. What are seraphim? Balls of fire? No, it's not like Jerry Lewis and a great ball of fire. But no, seraphim are fire, is fire. It's an angel, angelic being that is made of fire. Um, and cry with a loud voice, a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sat on them and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great. And, um, 
And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Um, the beast, and you can read the rest and go through. But this is the feast that's right there, um, the feast of, of Leviathan. With that, we're going to wrap up this teaching in Matthew. Uh, next week, hopefully, we'll finish up the rest of Matthew 24. Um, as I mentioned again, my teachings, I'm going to try to keep up and get up with doing them and get them out more regularly, but I'm going to need a little time to catch up because the last three weeks or so have been very, very time set time, uh, a big time crunch for me with everything I've been doing. May God bless you. You have a great day. And if you have questions, ask. Take care.